good morning. I would like to remind all of you, as well as our home viewers, that uh, you're supposed to have your selections for your group presentations in by September 7th. And in a friendly way, this is September 2nd. I don't know if I'm supposed to re make remarks about dates or not, but that's for your own uh, uh, knowledge, etc. Okay, uh, last time um, I talked about the uh, somewhat about the anthropology before the 19th century and uh, also anthropology in the early part of the 19th century. Um, first half of the 19th century, and we talked about uh, polygenesis and monogenesis, and uh, before that, the contribution of positivism by Comte and Saint Simon. Um, and then we started talking, or shifted gears, as it were, and started talking about, you know, what were some of the other uh, precursors, I guess is the way to look at it, of. Uh, events, phenomena that were extant, uh, that kind of ushered in this age of anthropology that occurred in 1859 and later. Um, and a principle among these, of course, was this notion of the um, widespread distribution of arrowheads, and I talked about that a little bit. And this one is one that's kind of dear to my heart because uh, my uncle, I had an uncle who uh, like to do that, like to walk around his farm and, and pick up arrowheads and talk about it. Of course, when my uncle was alive in his youth, he could walk around that same area and encounter uh, Native Americans, which is something I never did <laughs> or could do. Uh, but that shows you again maybe that I'm at the other end of this century than you, <laughs> or my own century. Um, uh, and another important thing to note, I think, uh, another consequence of this, another corollary, is that, uh, that I didn't mention last time, is that uh, this predominance of arrowheads, of stone tools, uh, widely distributed around the earth as well as in the United States, uh, meant that in the United States, this was a primary reason for establishing departments of anthropology. There was many departments of anthropology started off as departments of archaeology. And departments of archaeology, in turn, uh, got their impetus, their inspiration from the fact that there was a society of local archaeologists uh, that kind of pressured and, you know, were interested and they wanted to see that at their local university, their state university, uh, especially at land-grant colleges, uh, most of you know what that, those are, I assume. Houston is not one of those. A and M would be um, um, that they would encourage and did encourage departments of archaeology to be established. Those in turn uh, quickly evolved into departments of anthropology, where they included interests beyond archaeology. And then, after I talked about uh, the the widespread distribution of arrowheads, the second factor that I mentioned, uh, was, or I had just begun to talk about it, I think, was. Uh, this notion of uh, Lyell's of, of uniformitarianism. And uniformitarianism is this notion that uh, uh, the earth is um, displayed, <laughs> if you open it up anyway, into kind of layers. And as you go down, or in, increase the depth with which you look at something, you're also going back in time. So there's a, a kind of correlation again between um, depth and chronology. Uh, and what they recognized was that the deeper you went into the Earth's structure, the further back in time you were going. And what a, for those of you who are archaeology concentrators, what a lot of archaeology is about in terms of methodology is correcting for uh, events that occur that upset that kind of natural stratigraphy. You know, if a river comes through that area and it kind of uh, changes things around, then archaeology has techniques and methodologies that help to correct for that and to account for that. Uh, but anyway, this notion of this uniform uh, laying out, as it were, of the past uh, 
in terms of looking in the Earth's structure uh, came to us from this geologist by the name of Lyell. And at the time, as I mentioned last time, the competing doctrine was this notion of catastrophism, which was a notion that catastrophic events occurred, such as floods. Uh, you know, in the Old Testament, there's this rather large flood that was to have occurred. And then that would be followed by long periods of uneventful kinds of things, at least geologically speaking. Uh, and Lyell helped to dispel that, or his notions helped to dispel that. And for some reason, people embraced, even beyond elites and the educated intellectuals of that time, uh, again, the common folks, embrace this notion of uniformitarianism. I don't know if it was because they could see it themselves or what, and I don't know if any of you have ever done this. You know, you can dig a hole in your backyard, and of course the first thing you're going to come up with is things like Coke bottles and Coke bottle co taps, co you know, caps, we call them those things you pop off. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and then if you go further down, you're going to go, you're going to find things that were uh, from uh, greater historical times in terms of, of length of time. Um, you know, until uh, you get to the point where there's coal and diamonds, which, <laughs> you know, diamonds represent this notion that of, of great pressure of the earth coming down on organic materials over a long, 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 long period of time until that compression and pressure brings about the creation from coal to diamonds. But of course, that's much beyond the concern of archaeologists and of us, and it represents a point in time much before what we're talking about. But again, the, he noted that there was this natural stratigraphy that occurred, and this became uh, part and parcel of archaeology and archaeology's methodology. So two events then uh, contributed, were contributed importantly uh, from this time period that led to the development of archaeology as a discipline and helped to define and shape it. And in, indirectly, then, it also contributed to the notion of anthropology in the larger sense, not just archaeology in the narrower sense. Um, again, it seemed to, this particular um, notion seemed to contradict uh, the biblical interpretation of events, but not really, again, in terms of cultural evolution, uh, it would uh, allow for this. It would account for it. It wasn't that uh, contradictory. It wasn't that, as a theory, it wasn't confrontational, so to speak, in psychological terms. Even if you, from say, from the arrowheads, if you had a notion that there must have been groups of people or races of people that existed in earlier times, that just led to wild speculation and interest, and people's imagination soared with that. Think about it yourself, if you go back a century, and, or even more than a century now, and you, know, you have this notion that there's all this widespread evidence that, that somebody existed, at least thinking creatures existed, someone of higher intelligence, or at least of equivalent of intelligence, someone who could uh, look at a stone, um, although be it um, flint, and they could see it, and then they could shape it, because they had some kind of ideal tool in mind. Right? Uh, and, you know, that could lead to all kinds of, of uh, guesses on the part of our, uh, and our, our previous ancestors just from the last century. And it would give a few, lots of uh, wonderful speculation. Uh, of course, when you come to the science of something, that speculation all is kind of swept away to a certain extent. And, uh, and they talk about these folks, as we know later on from the uh, biological, anthropological evidence that was left behind, that they were folks very similar to ourselves biologically. Which brings me to my uh, third um, event or set of facts that existed that kind of helped to usher in what then became this field of anthropology. I didn't ask, uh, but if you have any questions, this is a good time to ask before I, I go on to other additional material about either the last lectures or any previous lecture or anything in your readings or whatever. Any, any questions? Good. <laughs> no, actually, I, I like questions, but uh, if you don't have any, that's just fine. Uh, the third um, precursor uh, 
uh, ushering in anthropology would be the fossil evidence for human evolution. I'm sure most of you have heard about those wonderful caves in, in France where you can go in and there's these very primitive paintings on the walls and it depicts scenes of hunting and well all kinds of things of daily lives in in creatures stick they look many of them look like stick figures although uh, you know these these obviously these caves in terms of the art that is there are priceless I would hope no one would put a price on them because that means that they would be removed and put on on the uh, television, uh, what's that thing where they sell things all the time? <laughs> I'd hate to see that. <laughs> Help! Uh, but anyway, uh, uh, but there are also other additional things. Those caves were discovered. In fact, if you know recently, there was uh, additional uh, caves discovered where more rock paintings were discovered or observed and again uh, seen. Um, uh, it gave evidence to uh, daily life in these early folks. But those folks, it turns out, live fairly uh, recently uh, in terms of human evolution or fossil evidence for human evolution. Uh, what really was very prevalent in uh, Germany, in France, and in fact throughout the world, uh, through certain areas of the world, I should say, not in the New World, not in the New World, unless you want to uh, encourage us to talk about Bigfoot and Sas uh, Sasquatch, uh, which uh, most... Um, I guess establishment anthropology, for lack of a better phrase, would not accept as being uh, that the evidence doesn't support the existence of such a creature in this part of the world, be it Oregon and beautiful streams, etc. Uh, and all those movies that have been made around Sasquatch and will continue to be made around Sasquatch. Uh, instead, in the area of Europe, what you had were many, many fossils partially fossilized skeletons, partially, partially uh, uh, skeletal structures, uh, not just fossils, but actual bones, of australopithecines. Uh, and, uh, no, excuse me, uh, this would be the Neand Neanderthals in this particular area. I don't really know of any australopithecine finds, but there are Neanderthals in the, in U in the European continent. And, but if we look at the larger picture and we go, say, to the area of Africa, uh, we would find these uh, same kinds of fossil evidence for human evolution of, of Australopithecines. But the concern with Australopithecines kind of occurred more at the turn of the century and, and the beginning of this century and, and later on and to the present day to the work of L.S.B. Leakey and his wife Mary Leakey and continued by their son. Uh, Richard Leakey, and also by an anthropologist, by the way, that, I, that he was an undergraduate at the University of Illinois when I was a graduate student there, and I, I got to know him, but of course at that time I didn't know he was going to become so famous, but the discoverer of Lucy, uh, whose name is David Johansson. And uh, anyway, uh, but anyway, in the, in the continent of Europe, there were a lot of these uh, remains that were available and discovered uh, of Australopithecus, excuse me, of, of Neanderthals or Homo sapiens neanderthalensis, as we would currently call them. Uh, but at that time, we didn't know who they were. We just knew that somehow they looked um, human, but they didn't look quite human. And in f one of the interesting things I th always thought about Neanderthal remains, especially in Europe, uh, and Neanderthal, by the way, comes from, is named after the Valley of Neander in Germany, and that's where that name comes from. Uh, but, you know, at that time, there was um, a historical tradition that if you discovered a fossil, it was named after you. So uh, it was uh, later generations of anthropologists, who, especially under the influence of zoology. Um, and, and at the moment, I've, the man's name escapes me, but if, if I re recall it, I'll, I'll bring it to your attention. Uh, he was the one who did, he wiped away this concern with... Uh, the, the specific finds and, and, and was able to generalize them into uh, this notion that they were all Neanderthals and they all had certain kinds of physical characteristics in common. But one of the things that always intrigued me was that one of the largest cr uh, craniums that's ever been found didn't belong to a Homo sapiens sapiens, which we always think it would, but rather it belonged to uh, one of these Neanderthals, uh, which, which leads to maybe a misnotion on our part sometimes that brain size is the most important characteristic. 
you know, if we were, if this were the topic, I would uh, rather point out that uh, it's uh, the complexity of neural tissue which makes us have the distinctive kinds of characteristics of thinking that we do. There's a, a, an article in the uh, Sunday Chronicle that recently that came out with this notion that animals think. And, of course, anthropologists have thought this for a long time, especially those that are concerned with the ethology and the study of the social life of, of primates. Uh, but, you know, we have this in common as related species. I think all mammals think to a certain extent. This is just a hunch on my part. It's not something I've studied myself, but, you know, all of us have been around our own pets and our own dogs and cats and, and if you have a pet cow or whatever you know <laughs> that one student did, uh, you know that they have certain kinds of characteristics that lead you to conclude that they can think, that they can actually, uh, to a certain degree, solve what we might call complex problems. And this is something that, w that we have in common with them, but we've taken it further, we've taken it more. And uh, I think it would be uh, behoove you to look at, at that article or that uh, account in the, uh, I think it was Sunday's paper in Chronicle, and look at those, those uh, statements and, you know, what the skeptics think about certain animals and what this recent studies show. It's actually based on a, a book that was recently published and has gained some degree of um, popularity. Um, so anyway, there were all these uh, skeletal materials, fossil remains of these creatures that weren't quite human. Uh, it, it, it gave rise to this notion of uh, uh, ape men, which I'm sure most of you have heard of, uh, and it was an important discussion. People talked about it more often at that time. And I hate to be sexist there, but that's what they called them. They didn't call them ape humans. They called them ape men. I guess they assumed that all the fossils they found were somehow male, uh, which, of course, would be silly. Uh, but on the other hand, this, this is the, the way they were presented, and this is how they were, were thought about. But uh, the notion was, and this was kind of a, a, a popular notion of, of evolution. It wasn't really representative of anyone, say, who had read Darwin. Uh, but rather, they, 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 they had these notions that Darwin would say, kind of translated into the popular culture, as it were. And they would have, you know, these, you see them today. I mean, they existed then and they exist to the present day. They've, they're always kind of Sunday supplements, as it were. And they, they have, you know, these blocks uh, 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 pictured and then they show the draw. I would try to draw a skull, but I'm not very good at it. And they would start off with, you know, Homo sapiens sapiens, which I don't know if they called it that. It was a current modern day man or humans. And they would show that. And it would show, you know, a relatively well configured uh, skull with a, a, a more reduced jaw structure in this area. And then alongside that, they would have some of these uh, Neanderthals. Uh, and then they would have a, a block with a question. And the block with a question represented what's the connection between humans and apes, the great apes. Because uh, the, 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 there was a widespread popular assumption that's that that's what Darwin's theory of evolution was about. Well, it wasn't, but that's neither here nor there. <laughs> That's what people in the larger culture uh, were convinced that that's what Darwin talks about. And even to this day, you'll hear when people rail and rant against evolutionary theory, you'll hear them rant against this notion that somehow we're related to apes or monkeys. And that's not what these folks were saying. That's not what Darwin or people later who studied Darwin um, were concluding. Rather, they were talking about how apes and humans both were descended from common uh, ancestors and somewhere way 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 back in time um, uh, there was that connection but anyway this uh, concern with ape men has been with us for a long time and probably will stay with us because it, it makes good reading on Sundays and so it helps to sell newspapers although there are many things going on currently that help to sell newspapers more than that uh, so beyond that then a, a fourth um, precursor of this age of anthropology, if you will, this early age 
of anthropology is this uh, Linnaean classification of plants and animals. At least that's one of the things that I saw. Everybody knew about that. The book was, to, at least to the educated public, was available. His books, his writings, where he would take plants and things non-controversial and you arrange them in categories and, and you could see which plants were related to what other plants and he would talk about genus and families and species and go from the general, more general categories to the more specific categories. And this was an area, if you will, of science and scientific writing that people could readily accept. Now, there's nothing controversial about plants and talking about plants coming to us from antiquity and, and you know, if you look at some of those early fossils, what they were about were ferns. Uh, and other kinds of plants, but at least one of those I think that gets widespread attention are ferns. But uh, Linnaeus came along and he had, he had categorized these plants into species and families and uh, phylogenies, etc. And uh, out of that came, uh, I think, a, a willingness, a, a readiness to accept later ideas that humans also belong in here that you can treat humans in exactly the same way. Again, this would be contrary to scripture, at least interpretation of scripture at that time, but that was a thing that, uh, or an event in terms of the intellectual life that was a precursor of anthropology as well and helped to set the way, helped to, to, uh, to allow people to uh, accept anthropological notions and ideas. Those are some of the major ones. You, uh, uh, you know, we had gone through this long time, and this time we're talking about our own history now, Western history, of uh, especially in the in France of revolution, of upheaval, and that had something to do with the discontinuity, intellectually speaking, between that 18th century notions of enlightenment and then these 19th century earlier theological notions, and how these folks had to. Uh, confront or, or explain uh, their position vis-a-vis -vis the uh, theological one. And I think it's important to realize that because this uh, concern with things theological on the part of many folks at this time uh, encouraged these early anthropologists to really frame their theories, their views of culture, their views of human nature almost in the same terms, but just slightly rearranged. I had talked about this notion, I believe, if I haven't, I'll mention it now, of cultural degeneration, which went along with these uh, uh, corollary notions of, of uh, polygenism, or polygenism, <laughs> whatever it was called, and uh, uh, monogism, uh, genism, which is, you know, either the... Um, or excuse me, the catastrophism, the uniformitarian is, that's what I'm talking about. Mono, I, and I, for some reason, I suddenly forgot how to pronounce mono, uh, what is it, monogenesis? Monogenesis, polygenesis. Uh, but what this refers to, this notion of cultural degeneration, is catastrophism and, and uniformitarianism again. What that was, was a, a, a contrary notion, again, against biblical notions. Uh, you know, the biblical story is of Adam and Eve, and, and they were in the Garden of Eden, and... Um, you know, God, or rather the devil, um, uh, visited them and offered them an apple, and Eve took it, and we're where we are today. Uh, the fall from grace, the fall from, and this is a widespread, uh, you know, Western myth, and something that really is important in our literature and other areas of the humanities in terms of our intellectual traditions. This notion of the fall from grace is something that all Westerners uh, are involved in, whether or not they're aware of it. It's, it's that widespread and that embedded in our cultural framework. But these early folks in the latter part of the 19th century, these early anthropologists, uh, came to view uh, things slightly differently. They didn't. This is what they would call this this biblical account, this view of the fall from grace, this accepting of the apple, uh, which is a, a metaphorical kind of representation, uh, is what we mean by cultural degeneration. In other words, if you take Adam and Eve before the f the fall from grace, they were already existing in a state of, of perfection, in a state of grace, uh, something that we might even find akin to uh, Christian notions of heaven. But once they accepted knowledge, as represented by that apple, once they ate of the apple, and once they became aware 
that they were uh, uh, creatures less than the divine and they were capable of making choices. I may be giving modern interpretations to this myth, so don't worry about it too much. <laughs> uh, uh, once they were aware of all those things, then they fell from that state of grace. So it's, they were already in a state of perfection and they became something less than perfection. And what Christian theology teaches us, especially from the New Testament, is how to re-achieve this state of grace. Not the state of perfection, but the state of grace. But to, to accept you know, the personal Savior in the form of Jesus, and, and in that act, one goes back to a state of grace. And that's what largely, at least, uh, theologians from the New Testament, or concerning the New Testament, teach us. But this theory of cultural degeneration is not necessarily what these early anthropologists talked about. And I don't know how to phrase it. It's not in the same way. Uh, they, they really talk about things as being uh, kind of almost a ladder mythology. And you start at the bottom with these, uh, what I mentioned earlier as Australopithecines. But it actually it would be a creature related to an Australopithecine. But concurrent with an Australopithecine, and maybe going back three million years, if not earlier, because every year we seem to be able to take it back further and further. When I was at university, they talked about them being a million years old. <laughs> now they talk about some of our ancestors being as old as three million or even longer. And of course, they go back to the dawn of time, if you want to trace them back to amoebas or unicellular creatures or something like that. But thankfully for you, I would assume, uh, anthropologists um, are concerned mostly with those uh, creatures that predated us and led to ourselves because it, it informs anthropology then about what humans are and where they um, derive certain characteristics, etc. Um, so now we're at a point in the lecture where we're actually going to talk about cultural evolution. We're actually going to talk about this first period in anthropological theory of culture uh, known as classical evolution or cultural evolution. And again, I want you to remember that this is the Victorian era. This is at a time when the industrial barons uh, were forging their empires and their economic empires and their industries throughout uh, the Western world and, and indeed into the far reaches of the world. Um, and uh, that notions of racism were becoming rampant. And when I say racism, I, I really mean state sanctioned racism or uh, something other than um, what other folks might call racism. Uh, for example, I think all humans, uh, irrespective of where they live or of their membership in particular cultures or what have you, have notions about themselves vis-a-vis -vis other groups of people. I remember when I was a uh, a very young green graduate student in Mexico and uh, studied in that village of San Andres de la Cal. There were about 300 Indians that lived in this village and 200 of them were Roman Catholic and about 100 of them were Mormon. And every Wednesday night this Mormon missionary appeared out of nowhere to, to apparently recruit more uh, uh, members of, for that congregation or that group. But they got along fairly well with one another. All of them had, just a few uh, decades before, been Roman Catholic. And uh, this was the beginning of a phenomenon which is now fairly widespread in Latin America, the spread of evangelism and the spread of, a, of even Pentecostal-type groups among the working classes and lower classes of, of Latin American populations. But anyway, um, uh, when I went to that village, they... They thought, they, they told me things about, you know, we speak, uh, I think you, if you ever go to Latin America, you'll hear somebody say this. We speak um, Castellano, they speak Espanol. And the whole notion of that is they speak more pure Spanish, their Spanish is better, and they're better than those other folks. I remember they were talking about the neighboring village uh, whose name escapes me at the moment, and they said, we're much better than they are. Not only do we speak Castellano, but, but we don't make our women work in the fields like they do. And I would always look over there, and there would be only men in the fields. So I didn't really know what they were talking about. But again, there was this, you know, we all have these notions. My high school is better than your high school. We beat you all the time in football, basketball, whatever. Uh, we have this kind of, uh, almost it's a part of the nature to be human, I think, to be competitive in this sense, to think of your own group as being better than groups around you. This is not the kind of group um, 
prejudice uh, bias that I'm, I'm speaking of here. This is where uh, entire nations of people or entire regions of the earth were denigrated as being less than in this notion of racism that became so popular in this latter part of the 19th century. And it became tied to biological notions. So it was a, a bio, at least a primitive view of biology uh, and uh, in terms of their attitudes about races and etc. And then a, an accompanying uh, cultural notion or set of attitudes were embedded in this economic notion of laissez-faire, which, which I th see as directly related to uh, survival of the fittest. You know, laissez-faire is a group of nations, and if they're competing with one another uh, in commerce or what have you, those which are better will survive and do more and succeed and become more successful and, and do away and banish and destroy and conquer those that are less capable. And after all, we had just finished uh, experiencing, you know, several centuries of that in terms, again, of the conquest by Westerners of other parts of the world. And we see that as so important because we're Westerners. I mean, you know, if you go to Asia and you look at Asia as a separate area of culture and cultural traditions, they had been conquering each other for <laughs> centuries before that and making empires uh, while people in Europe were still chipping stones. So... Uh, we shouldn't take, pat ourselves on the back too much. But anyway, that's what we had just experienced, and we were the most recent conquerors on the scene, and we had uh, now transformed that in terms of laissez-faire and economic notions of capitalism. We were now becoming the same kinds of creatures, but it, we were competing economically with one another, and industrialization gave us the ability to do that, not only to compete, but to win. And so it became uh, uh, something that was... Um, much to our advantage and helped us. So we have all these notions then at the same time that have been ushered in or are there by the time the Victorians were in place. And that is uh, technologically it was racism. In terms of attitudes it was, ra uh, excuse me, in terms of technology it was industrialization. In terms of attitudes it was racist and in terms of values that were associated with its economic institutions of capitalism and these notions of laissez-faire. And then all those things that we talked about before, mentioned about social Darwinism, this, these attitudes of the survival of the fittest. It is at this point that I would have wanted to show you a film, but we're not, we haven't been able to uh, get the copyright for it to be able to show it. But it's a commercial film, and it's one that's available in your local blockbuster. Uh, and so you'll be able to get it. And I would encourage you to get it because you'll enjoy it, number one, as a film. Uh, now, it does have sex scenes in it, so that if that somehow uh, puts you off, then you should be <laughs> forewarned. But it, they're, they're not really salacious, or not, and they're certainly not gratuitous. If anything, they're artistic and <coughs> wonderful to behold. <laughs> but in that uh, film of Angels and Insects, it is an account of what life was like in the latter part of the 19th century, especially among the aristocracy, members of the aristocracy, and how they were thrilled by Darwinian evolution and how they saw that as being translated in their own pedigrees. I mean, you know, after all, if you were a member of the upper class, it's important to bring attention to genetic background. Uh, not in terms of tracing hemophilia or insanity, but rather in terms of, of this notion of the survival of the fittest. And if, we've, if we're members of the upper class, if you take that point of view, then you, you justify your position. You justify the status quo. And in, the, in the America, and also then uh, secondarily, I think, in, in Europe, and, uh, there were also these industrial barons that were able to take these same notions and justify their own existence and justify what they were doing. Uh, to the other people and to other peoples in the rest of the world. In the 60s, these became uh, targets of hatred and anger and, you know, uh, showing what was really evil about our nature. But that's beyond us and a part of my history that isn't necessarily a part of your history. Um,
Uh, anyway, in this film Angels and Insects, there's some wonderful scenes in there, and I really do encourage you to, to uh, check this film out and, and view it over the weekend, uh, because you'll get a notion of how uh, intellectual ideas or scientific advances become translated into popular culture, or at least at that time would have been upper-class educated culture, but nonetheless popular for them, uh, and how they use that to, uh, to think about themselves. Anyway, it's a good film, and I, I really encourage you to see it. Uh, so all that aside, uh, then in 1859, as I said, we have this publication of Darwin's volume. It sets the stage for including humans as a natural phenomena or phenomenon. Um, we then see the writers that have, you know, stick with us to the present time. They were important then, they're important currently. Uh, if you're a sociologist, you're more likely to talk about Spencer, or if you're a member of AA, <laughs> that uh, quote in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, uh, there's one in there by Spencer. I encourage you to look it up so you can see what I'm talking about. Um, but the ones that anthropologists more often talk about are Edward Tyler and uh, uh, Lewis Henry Morgan, or as I say in shorthand, Morgan and Tyler. <laughs> Uh, so Tyler is a British, uh, one of the first British anthropologists, and Morgan is an early American anthropologist. And I think these two are selected out more often than the others. There were lots of writers at this time, lots of writers who talked about these kinds of things, um, which we'll, you'll, you'll know what these kinds of things are in a moment, um, because they were also even without intending to be empirical and scientific in what they did, or at least an early form or version of that. And of course, they didn't see themselves as being different from the other writers of that time. We look back at it with hindsight, we say, oh, these are better because they're more nearly conforming to the standards and, and criteria that we have in the 20th century, right? Uh, but that's not necessarily what Tyler and Morgan were about. But there were lots of writers at this time. Bachofen, McLennan, they were from uh, England and that area. They're also from uh, uh, the, Europe, the continent of Europe. Um, in some ways, I think it does a great injustice, but in some ways Karl Marx can also be seen as, as just one other uh, writer about uh, stages of cultural evolution, which is what these folks would talk about. There are a lot of writers at this time that would talk about these notions of the stages of, of cultural evolution. Now, again, this, these weren't the first. If we go back to the Enlightenment, they'd already set down kind of the framework, if you will, for uh, these notions. Uh, but certainly you have that break then uh, due to the kind of upheaval that occurred with the French Revolution uh, on the continent of Europe and in England and in the United States. And then you had this resurgence of biblical... Uh, theology, and then you come back to it again with the publication of 1859 of Darwin's Origin of the Species. So that sets it up in a broad way. Uh, you know, you had the 18th century Enlightenment, you had those first beginning statements, uh, treatises, if you will, of man as a byproduct of of uh, natural phenomena, that they were placed in the natural universe, that they were seen as creatures like all other creatures. And uh, the Enlightenment, folks, that's what that Enlightenment refers to. It isn't uh, that the, suddenly they knew that Christ was real. It was suddenly they realized that humans were a part of this natural laboratory, if you will, that exists out there in the world, and that humans responded to their environments, uh, as it turns out, not only biological environments, but cultural environments as well. And so then you had uh, the French Revolution, you had the resurgence of biblical theology, you then come to 1859, in which there's kind of a, a, a lessening then of the influence of biblical theology and uh, a greater importance given to um, uh, Darwin's work. You know, Darwin's work, when it was first published, lacked an important uh, genetic component. He didn't really have a well-developed notion of genetics yet. That remained uh, for a priest in the latter part of the 19th century to write articles about that, and that completed these uh, 
biological evolutionary kinds of concerns. But again, in, in this course, when, since it's on the theories of culture, we're really more interested in the ways in which these biological notions became translated into cultural notions and the ways in which people, these writers, uh, Spencer, Tyler, Morgan, and others, uh, thought and talked about and uh, wrote at this time, because these works are still with us. Again, we're coming in, you know, we're always in seemingly in, in the middle of political campaigns, but every uh, c campaign I've ever been a um, participant or observer to, and by now I've been through several, <laughs> uh, every four years, every, it's actually not every four years, because as you know, we're not electing a president for a year or so yet, and we're already uh, you know, know who's going to run, and we think, and we know if we think who's going to win. Certainly, if we pay attention to what the media tell us, although they have been undone in the recent past and in previous times, and may well be done undone this time. Um, but anyway, uh, when you hear those political uh, debates, those whether you you might call them information sessions, you might call them diatribes, depending on who's speaking and how what you think about their ideas. But they're they're always caught up, they're always in involved in these notions of social Darwinism. You know, when you hear uh, George W. Bush speak, or if you hear Al Gore speak, he's gonna talk about things that these social Darwinists, at least uh, at this time, said, and, and some of the things that these anthropologists who existed at this time spoke, uh, Spencer, Tyler, and Morgan. Um, it would be interesting, you know, what inspired these people to be and to think in a time period which it would have been very unfashionable to do that. But remember, again, that most of these folks were actually trained and educated as lawyers. For some reason, a category of people today who are somewhat, at least culturally, it's popular to despise them, although it's also popular to join them, because uh, uh, there's a belief that that's where great wealth lies uh, with easy access. Uh, I think that ignores a lot of work that some of them have to do, etc. <laughs> but all that, that's not a concern of ours. Uh, these, both uh, Tyler and Morgan were lawyers, and in uh, Lewis Henry Morgan's case, he was a person in, that lived in New York, and he could just walk outside of his house and look around him, and they were Native Americans, the Iroquois. And that's so his, his books, as it were, are on the, are, are accounts of the Iroquois, and, and really from some of his works, we are aware of some of our own uh, government notions, some of our own attitudes and ideas actually come to us from Native American culture of, of the Iroquois and others as well, but Morgan makes us aware of that, not because he pointed it out, but because he presents those ideas and we see that they're at least similar to ones that we have and we think they're contributory. Um, but Lewis Henry Morgan had this notion, which you don't have to be concerned with, but just to, to explain why in, in the Cold War era, in the Soviet Empire, you know, they have a league or a, a, a place of heroes, or I can't remember what it's called now, but Lewis Henry Morgan, uh, you know, is a member of that group. And, you know, ask yourself why. We had this, he had this notion of primitive communism. And he said that communism is kind of a natural state of early humans and you know so then succeeding generations of development cultural and otherwise represent artificial uh, developments and actually that's a misreading or an overreading of what Morgan was talking about he just meant that uh, human beings in these in their early communities uh, were reciprocal, where they ha they had an egal set of egalitarian notions, and that they shared things in common. And certainly, the things that all of these groups shared, he thought, were such things as the land. So there wasn't a notion of capitalist ownership of these natural resources. And you know, I create this empire and knock you out of the control over those natural resources, uh, etc. But anyway, he had these notions when he would talk about early human groups, and that appealed to the ideologues of the uh, Cold War on the Soviet side. So that's how he got there, but he would have been more surprised than we would have to find himself there <laughs> in that hall of heroes. Um, all right, there are certain basic assumptions that all of these writers in this latter part of the 19th century 
I shared in. Uh, and these assumptions, there are three of them. I'll go ahead and give them to you, and then uh, we'll talk about them in greater detail. Excuse me here. They are, in uh, order of discussion, uh, the psychic unity of mankind, Why? <laughs> Second would be a notion of parallel evolution. And third would be a notion of comparative, uh, of the comparative method. Now let me be clear here. This represents an analysis, and an analysis of the writing of this time that people would come along and say, well, these points of view only make sense if you acknowledge that these folks had three assumptions that they just kind of thought everyone shared. And, and so they, and these assumptions inform their writings, inform their views, but, and they make sense if you accept them. Yeah, but you would have to accept them. Um, all right, the first one, the psychic unity of mankind. It was not, again, a notion that was original with the... Um, 19th century anthropologists. They, uh, actually, some of these notions were much earlier, even before the Enlightenment in certain writings. But it's something that these folks took up, accepted, and had taken from their own intellectual tradition or history. And that is that mankind, or read in current terms humans, both men and women, everywhere and I will, I'll say these slowly enough so you can take it down, that humans everywhere exhibit similar mental characteristics. Again, this is that first assumption, the psychic unity of mankind, or, and that's what they called it, so let's take that word, or just call it the psychic unity. Um, that mankind everywhere exhibits similar mental characteristics. Consequently, humans everywhere, meaning wherever they exist, this is a very progressive idea for this time, so listen to it carefully. That humans everywhere will respond in a like manner to similar situations. I'm going to read that over again. Humans everywhere exhibit similar mental characteristics. Consequently, humans everywhere will respond in a like manner to similar situations. This concept, the psychic unity of humans, explains the independent origins of similar culture traits and the constancy C-O-N-S-T-A-N-C-Y the constancy of developmental stages in widespread parts of the world Okay, let's talk about that now. Do I need to repeat any of it before we talk about it? Okay, I'll go over it again. I'll give it to you once more. Humans everywhere exhibit uh, similar mental characteristics. Consequently, humans everywhere will respond in a like manner to similar situations. And that's the essence of the psychic unity of mankind. And it is used to explain the independent origins of similar culture traits and the constancy, the constancy of developmental stages 
in widespread parts of the world. Okay? Yes, question. Independent origins of similar culture traits. Okay? Okay, what were they talking about? Well, it's something that's still talked about today. I think the, the most recent incursion of it in, in popular culture uh, was the fellow that... Uh, what did he write about? I can't remember the books now. It was uh, something of the God. No, um, these were novels that came out in the '60s and then were made into movies in the '70s. Uh, and they 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 took these notions. Uh, Charity of the Gods. Yeah, and uh, the notion was that for that book was that uh, if you go to Cusco, if you go to Peru, and you look at it from a different perspective than what archaeologists and historians had looked at it in the past, uh, you would see that it really represented a landing field so that um, the source of human creativity, the sources of human culture, came to us from astronauts, uh, other folks' astronauts, other universes' astronauts from outer space. And then he would look at some of those uh, reliefs on, carved in stone structures, and he would say, see, if you really look at it right from my perspective, you can see this is some fellow on a motorcycle. And he's, you know, <laughs> whatever. He had seen too many Marlon Brando movies, I suspect. <laughs> but he was a, um, a, a convict and a playwright. Uh, in terms of his history. So as a playwright, he, he became very successful because he could write better than most anthropologists at that time. Uh, and his, his presentation became very popular and very influential and all the media talked about it. Which means you've got to remember that what the media talk about sells, not necessarily is scientifically valid or is something that came out of the minds of someone who's uh, a specialist in these areas. But anyway, in, at, at this time, uh, there were these notions that uh, that around the world there were things, there were events, archaeological and otherwise, that were very similar to one another. And, and people would try to explain this similarity. You know, um, there's another group of, of uh, folks more on the continent than uh, in uh, England and the United States, who, were com who had competing uh, theoretical notions of culture at this time. And they were called diffusionists. I, th I don't know if I'm spelling it right. <laughs> I think that's right, but I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, and diffusionists, uh, one of them is Father, uh, one best known is Father Wilhelm Schmidt, who was a priest as well. And when he looked at things around the world, and saw these similarities from one major region of Earth to the other, he would attribute their similarity to contact. That people had actually been in contact with one another and they exchanged ideas and artifacts and, and that explains why they seemingly were so uh, similar to one another or at least had characteristics that were similar to one another. This is very similar to the argument that except I think uh, Joseph Campbell took a more uh, anthropological uh, notion as opposed to a diffusionist notion. Oh, I've misspelled diffusionist. I can see because I left an S out. <laughs> um, uh, when he talks about these fertility figures that occur in every major area of the world where you have agricultural development occurring or the invention of agriculture occurring as human populations shift from pre-agriculture or hunting and gathering to agriculture or domestication of plants and animals. Uh, in the early stages of agriculture you always have these fertility figures, female fertility figures. Uh, an example of this would be the Venus of Düsseldorf. I remember once uh, being given a, a large button that you you know, pin on your suit or whatever as you walked around this conference of anthropologists depicting the Venus of Düsseldorf and, uh, and having it ripped off by early feminists who thought it was very sexist to do. And of course, I just was thinking it was uh, a great button to put on your coat. <laughs> but anyway, it, it, uh, 
Uh, Joseph Campbell we would say that this represents this notion of fertility, this no these notions of, of the earth as a, as a source of life, and that agriculture represents that as well. It, it created notions of what earth means and what the land means and what living on the land means. And you, you can see that's a kind of cultural trait that would be found in Asia, would be found in our own European prehistory, and it would be found in e even examples of New World prehistory, both in South America and to a lesser extent in uh, North America, but certainly in Central America as well. And so there's widespread examples of that particular cultural trait. How do you explain that? Well, they thought there, at this time, in the latter part of the 19th century, they thought there were two ways of explaining it. One was this psychic unity of, of humans, and the other one was the diffusionists. And the fusionists said that, you know, that you explain the widespread similarity or identity of certain cultural traits by, well, that's just evidence of contact, prehistoric contact. You know, in, in more modern times, I think he's now deceased, but uh, certainly up until the 60s, there was a, a man or a gentleman by the name of Thor Heyerdahl who used to write about these things, and he was always identified on the, on the, uh, a television and other news depictions as being an anthropologist. As far as I know, he was an adventurer, which doesn't make him any less. It just means he wasn't a part of uh, any kind of intellectual tradition. Um, and he would he wrote about the Contiki, the raft that you know he built, and he could you know sail it from uh, the Middle East or wherever it was, uh, Africa to the New World, and that was then proof that that's probably where civilizations in the New World came from. There was prehistoric contact, which isn't reflected, and so that means that there was uh, that kind of contact. But uh, later archaeologists and anthropologists, such as Julian Stewart, and these folks, uh, earlier writers, uh, you know, talked about there, there were cultural innovations, there were cultural notions in the New World that made them distinctive and separate, and so that there is this uh, ability of humans everywhere and anywhere, as long as you place them in the right environment, or the appropriate environment, right's a, a kind of a culturally connotated term, so we'll take right out of it. And uh, they would, uh, you know, they'll just naturally do that. That's what human nature is about. So if you place uh, humans in an environment um, where the conditions for inventing agriculture are right, they'll invent it. So you don't have, so you can either say that, which is what these folks said, or you can say that agriculture came to the folks of the new world uh, because they had been in contact with folks from the old world, and that's why uh, Native Americans in the new world uh, had these notions and that, that led to the development of corn agriculture. Um, not true as far as I know. Certainly the archaeological res record doesn't support it. Uh, but again, uh, that's what folks noted. And when they looked at uh, the uh, structures, the monolithic structures, the great stone structures in South America, especially in the Peruvian area and in the highland Andes, and then they would look at other areas of the world, they, they saw commonalities. Well, the commonalities are because you're not looking at them very closely. For example, they would compare them with the pyramids. Well, if you look at the pyramids, they're really not very comparable to the stone structures that were developed in Peru and other areas of the New World. So they, in my mind anyway, they really, they were uh, structurally different. They were functionally different in the sense that the reasons that they, how they were used, what they were used for, were quite different from each other. Uh, quite distinctive, seemingly had little continuity or did not speak to one another in terms of cultural traditions. Uh, so that I think the diffusionist arguments to a large extent were unfounded and based on speculation, certainly at this time, uh, and, and could not account for these widespread uh, development of similar cultural traits um, or the constancy taking those similar cultural traits and building them into something larger to talk about the developmental stages in widespread parts of the world. Well, uh, which leads us to the second assumption uh, that these 19th century anthropological writers had, which was this notion of parallel evolution. <laughs> 
And so, again, you'll have to write. Because of the psychic unity of mankind. Obviously, I'm taking these quotes directly from somewhere, so that's why they're worded in a stilted way. Because of the psychic unity of mankind, and, therefore, of independent origins, of like cultural traits, comma, <laughs> the cultures of human groups everywhere, the cultures of human groups everywhere, evolve along similar lines. Again, because of this psychic unity of humans and therefore of the independent origins of like cultural traits, those are the factors we had just talked about, the cultures of human groups everywhere evolve along similar lines. This would be the theory that they, that later scholars would name parallel evolution. Uh, a lot of these early, uh, latter part of the 19th century scholars were mislabeled by succeeding generations of anthropologists as being um, linear evolutionists or theories of, of unilineal evolution, uh, which is not quite right. I think the parallel evolution as an as a adjective is much more accurate. Uh, but they would say that all humans, wherever they exist, have gone through three major stages of cultural development. And these are savagery, their terms, not ours, um, Barbarism. Now, when you call someone a barbarian, you're going to know what it means. Barbarism. <laughs> and uh, civilization. We're going to talk a little more about this, and this will probably be as much as we can cover today. Oh, no, that's, no, we might have a little longer time. I'm sorry. Um, savagery is that state or stage of development of hunting and gathering. That's what I would read it as. These are technological categories, first of all. And then second of all, they're cultural categories, but they're primarily defined by uh, technological innovation. So we start off with, uh, with uh, savagery. Uh, they even divided savagery into lower savagery middle savagery and higher savagery. Uh, and lower savagery had to do with the beginnings of human cultures. So uh, how would you come up with a scheme like this? Well, the way they would come up is they would look at themselves in Victorian England, automatically identify that they were civilized. And so that which would appear to be the most unlike them would be what savages, sa savages were about. Uh, something which the, the succeeding um, generation of thinkers in terms of theories of culture would disagree with severely. Uh, but anyway, that's the way they would look at it. And they would say uh, that savages were kind of people that kind of roamed the earth um, hunting and uh, gathering. The men would hunt, the women would gather. And uh, when the situation or the inspiration hit them, they would have sex, and they would have lots of sex, and they would have sex without morals, and sex and behavior without ethics. And uh, so I, sometimes I've referred to these, and there actually is an article entitled this as the humpers and gatherers, as opposed to the hunters and gatherers. And as far as I know, 
when you look at the broad scheme of cultural groups around the world, be they low level or simple level, technologically speaking, or advanced levels such as ourselves, or somewhere in between, uh, there have never been a group of people that were this carefree about sex or engaged in it without some system of thinking about it, a system of morals, a system of ethics in terms of the behavior uh, governing the uh, behavior of one person towards another. But this was a, this early stage of savages were thought of this way and they, they um, uh, obviously they were demeaned. Uh, and they were thought to be the least human. The, but the important word here is to use is the least civilized. Because their big concern was this uh, civilization uh, and being identified as being civilized. Because if you, and you think of the writings of James Conrad, if you think of, of Gunga Din, if you think of uh, and Rudyard Kipling, and you think of other authors of this time in, in British writing, and they're talking about uh, civilized folks and civilized behavior and the civilized world, this is what they're doing is they're somehow, they're setting themselves apart. And at the apex, if you will, at the height of, of human attainment, uh, culturally speaking and technologically speaking, um, that, w that humans had gone. In a way, I want you to see that this is a reframing of biblical and theological notions. It's taking all of human prehistory and history and putting it into a conceptual framework that uh, uh, another uh, theologian was talked about later as the heavenly city of St. Augustine. And that's why social scientists have many times been labeled as social engineers. This is where this all comes from. You know, that, and this is where uh, social scientists become identified with uh, liberal politics as opposed to conservative. And some of these notions I will leave somewhat undeveloped and as time goes on, hopefully we will develop them more at a later lecture. But at least maybe this will capture your imagination and keep you with me <laughs> in terms of your attention. Um, so barbarianism then, is a, or barbarism as a stage in cultural development, technologically speaking, is associated with the development of agriculture as savagery is associated with just hunting and gathering and stone age technology. So when you call someone a barbarian now, you're really just saying you agriculturalist you, uh, which is, you know, when you see it that way, it has much less impact and emphasis. So you may want to use barbarian instead because it sounds so much more uh, judgmental and prejudicial. Um, And, well, let's not, no, we don't need to go into that. That's more of an archaeological topic, how the notion of, of uh, agriculture has changed, at least in terms of the perceptions of anthropologists over time. All right, this third assumption, third basic assumption, the comparative method of, um, well, I hadn't done civilization yet, had I? Uh, for that, let's do that first, and then we'll go to um, the third one. Uh, civilization at least for these folks, had to do with all those cultures around the world that had a written language. This they saw as the big transformation that separated the barbarians from the civilized. And uh, while I acknowledge that the Gutenberg Press is a primal, a extraordinary, uh, not a primal, extraordinary event, a kind of watershed event in, in human history uh, because it meant that the printed word could be given to many more folks and made accessible, so it was a great democratizing influence. At the same time, uh, I don't want to leave civilization at this, this simple that people could write. Although, in terms of you know, being able to do that and go from just the spoken language to the written language is indeed an important, uh, technologically and culturally speaking, both an important event. At the same time, uh, today we would can, we would associate this period of civilization more with a, a comparable technological uh, innovation, which would be those innovations connected with industrialization. But they were living in the time of what they're calling civilization, so they weren't able to have maybe some of the distance that we can give it today or 
uh, had not yet refined it to the point where they would be able to think of it in that way. So civilized folks for them meant those uh, humans who had developed um, intelligence enough or developed their technology enough or their culture enough where they had these ideas of writing or setting down what they spoke in a written form, be it hieroglyphic or be it alphabet, such as we, a phonetic alphabet, such as uh, English is somewhat based on, although not for those of you who don't speak English natively, uh, you may not see that it's that phonetic. Uh, Spanish, by the way, was rewritten uh, and changed into being more phonetic, and that's why it seems to be not uh, as um, encumbered with, uh, you know, the, those things about O-U-G-H in English that are just the devil to someone who's trying to learn English for whom it's not their native language. And there is no correspondence between those written uh, letters and the way you pronounce it. Bow through cough, just to give you three examples. And that's very difficult to remember if you're not a native speaker of English and you're learning it uh, secondhand. Uh, but anyway, we still have written language and it's very evolved in terms of it represents that we are solidly in the camp of those folks these writers would have identified as being civilized. And that's important. Uh, anyway, uh, what they assume that when you looked around the world and you saw uh, similar stages of culture existing. And um, you would realize that the earlier stages didn't die out. That even though all human beings seem to have this natural development of going from savagery to barbarism to civilization, not all folks had made that path. Not all folks had given up being savages. Uh, and how would they explain this? Well, they would say, well, the right situation just hadn't occurred yet. The right factors in the environment hadn't been made present. Uh, there was really no need for them to, yet, notice I say yet, there was really no need yet for them to go from savagery to barbarism. Or there was no need yet in their development for them to develop those kinds of uh, innovations that we associate with folks who are civilized, or they associated with folks who were civilized. So when we realize then that earlier stages of cultural development really never completely die out, they thought. Although today I might argue with them. Because when I look around the world, there are actually very few examples of Stone Age peoples. And those that are still existing, at least known, uh, are very few in number, and they've become fewer and fewer and fewer over time, and, and become more in the uh, inaccessible regions of the world. You know, most recently, I think we had a, in the six, late 60s, early 70s, you had uh, Lindbergh, one of his last uh, flings with fame, was to uh, go to the Philippines, and there they had discovered the uh, Tassadai. Everybody remember the Tassadai? Maybe you don't because you're not old enough because, or you were so little at that time or you maybe you hadn't been born yet. Uh, the Tassadai were a group of about 27 people who were in the Philippines and they were immediately defined as an anthropological treasure because they had a Stone Age technology. Uh, of course, there are only 27. Keep that in mind. Uh, and uh, they existed in kind of a pristine environment, lots of pools, lots of cold, clear pools, and, and they would run around uh, uh, mostly unclothed, and they uh, were a very friendly people. Imagine what it must have been like from the other side, from the viewpoint of the Tassadai. You know, they're living their lives, <laughs> and suddenly in the air is a helicopter. <laughs> and all, out of that comes people from NBC and other... Uh, news agencies of the world, and Lindbergh, and uh, 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 Filipino officials, etc., uh, to document them, to take pictures of them, to, to give an account of them, and to protect them. You know, this was, uh, became a political ploy on the part of, of um, the regime in power in the, in the Philippines at that time, uh, the Marcoses, both uh, Imelda and Mr. Marcos. And, uh, and people... Uh, uh, doubted the authenticity of the Tassadai because of this. But actually, as far as we know, they were an actual group of people, and they were authentic, and they were genuine, but they did become a, a, a kind of a political ploy uh, 
on the part of the Marcos regime because he wanted to show the world that his regime, his administration, his political uh, power structure was somehow kind to uh, all peoples, including savages existing in their own midst. And uh, these folks, the Tassadai, also became extremely important to anthropologists because we were engaged in the Vietnam era at this time. And here was a group of people who had no word for war, who had no words for fighting, who had no words in their vocabulary for conflict. And so they thought of this as, the, as, the, uh, as a natural state of humans early in time also that uh, seemingly uh, gave the, across the view of human nature that they would have. All right, today I've given you uh, some of the assumptions, and that I think is the important part of today's lecture, of these 19th century evolutionists. Uh, and these are the psychic unity of humanity, uh, parallel evolution, and... Um, uh, the comparative method. And I'll have something to say about this next time and continue to develop some of these ideas. I thank you for your attention, and I'll see you uh, next week. <laughs>